G'day and welcome to the Winter Campfire series. My name is Ryan and here we tell true crime to come out of Australia. Now in today's story, we're going to be covering three strange disappearances where it just seemed the bushland or the forest just swallowed these people up and there's zero explanation behind it. Now all three of these stories come out of David Politis' book called Missing 411, where he was a former police officer who covered hundreds of strange disappearances. So make sure you're nice and rugged up, tight in bed, all warm for these campfire creepy stories. So without further ado, let's get stuck into the story. This is the story of seven-year-old Bruce Farron, a young boy who went on a hike with his family in the Uinta mountain range in Utah and experienced something truly unexplainable. Now, it was June 23rd, 1963, on a beautiful, hot, warm day. And Bruce's aunt and uncle had planned for a three-kilometer hike to a popular swimming hole in the mountains. Now, Bruce was excited to spend the day with his two cousins and the group set off on their adventure packed with a few water bottles and some snacks. Now only being three kilometers, it should only take you about roughly 30 to 45 minutes to achieve this walk. Now, when they got there, everyone was having a great time swimming in the swimming hole. But then Bruce needed to go to the bathroom to where his uncle pointed at the tree line just next to the swimming hole and said, just head into there, buddy, and do your business. However, when Bruce didn't return after a few minutes, his aunt and uncle started to worry. Now they searched for him, yelling out his name, and even some people that were in the swimming hole also jumped out to the tree line, yelling out Bruce's name in hope that he would yell out back to them. But to their scary response, they heard nothing. Now this went on for about an hour until the panic really started to set in and that's when they called the authorities to where a search was deployed that exact day. Now the search continued on into the night and unfortunately Bruce could not be found. The family was devastated and everyone was praying for his safe return. Now another strange fact was sniffer dogs couldn't pick up on any single scent within a 10 kilometer radius which was also quite strange. Not only that, none of the trackers could find any marks or any track marks in the bushland to where his whereabouts was. It wasn't until the next day at 4pm in the afternoon where Bruce's miraculous survival story began to unfold. A group of hikers discovered him in a completely different area of the mountain range. Matter of fact, it was 32 kilometers away from where he was last seen. Now, it seemed impossible for a seven-year-old to cover such long distance on his own, especially in the mountain rugged terrain. But there he was, alive and well. Now, typically according to search and rescue statistics, boys between seven to 11-year-old is typically found about 10 to 11 kilometers away from the point of where they were last seen. And that's usually found knocking on death's door with injuries and dehydration. But not Bruce. And mind you, he was swimming when he was seen last in a pair of shorts and no shoes. And in the mountain range being 500 meters above sea level, it drops down to zero at nighttime. Now the family was overjoyed to see Bruce again and he was quickly taken to the hospital for a medical checkup. To everyone's surprise, he was in perfect health with no scratches or no injuries and no dehydration. But what is even more baffling is what Bruce told the authorities and his family that day that he was found. Now check this out. So Bruce claims that he cannot remember a thing from when he went into the tree line. But what he does remember is when he was at nighttime, he was kept warm and safe by a furry animal. Now he said there was multiple animals or in his words, many animals. But there was this one that climbed over him and kept him warm at night time. And according to the medical experts, it kept him fed as he had food in his digestive system and he passed stool when he got to the hospital, which means he had food in his stomach. Now, what was even more baffling was his feet. Now, anyone who's going to cover a long distance, especially 32 clicks over a mountain range, 
your feet are going to be absolutely butchered. And that's even if you are wearing combat boots that are designed for hiking. You're still gonna get hot spots on your foot and uh, rub marks and blisters, but not Bruce. Bruce had not a scratch on his feet. And the fact that he kept warm in sub-zero temperatures in a mountain range in the middle of Utah still has people baffled to this day on how that happened. All right, guys, that's a wrap for story number one. Now let's get into story number two. All right, so story number two is equally terrifying if it's a lie and it's equally terrifying if it's the truth. But either way, it's definitely scary when someone just gets swallowed up by the forest and never to be seen again. So this is a story of Barbara Bullock, a 55-year-old woman who was happily married to a husband of 14 years who was very fit, happy, and healthy. Now, Barbara had a passion for hiking, so she was always looking for new hiking spots, but her favorite hike was a short little hike that was in Idaho that led you up to a spot called the Bear Overlook. Now, the Bear Creek Overlook was this magnificent lookout that looked down into the valley. So she could often be caught being seen on that trail every single week, hands down. Now, in July of 2007, Barbara's husband said that his cousin Donna is coming to stay with them for the weekend and she's bringing her new boyfriend, Jim Rawmaker. Now, the couple arrived and Barbara being so in love with going on hikes, she invited the couple for the hike to go and look at the Bear Overlook, to which they both agreed that night to go. But typically, just like when you invite anyone to do something physical, where it's the gym or a hike, the next morning's always a different story and the excuses start coming out. Now, this is where Donna said, hey, I don't really feel that well, so I'm gonna sit this one out, but you and my boyfriend Jim go and have a blast. So it's now the next morning and it's 5 a.m. fresh in the morning when the birds aren't even awake yet. Now everyone's pulled the pin on this hike as it's too early, they don't wanna do it. So now we've just got Barbara and Donna's new boyfriend, Jim. So they've set off in the car and they've made it to the car park of the lookout for their five kilometer trek with their snacks in their camelback in hand. Now at 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon, Barbara's husband received a phone call that would change everything. To where the local police station called him and said, hey, you need to come down to the station as we have Jim here that was on the hike with your wife and your wife is now missing. To where he freaked out and said, how could she go missing when she's walked this track like a hundred times before and why is Jim there? What's, what's the go? Why, is Jim okay? to where the police responded, just come down because Jim has a story to tell you. Now with this, Barbara's husband's just dropped everything he's doing, he's in a complete panic and he's fled straight down to the police station and wondering what is going on. Now when they sat him down, they gave him a story that kinda didn't add up to him. Now Jim claims that they made it to the Bear Lookout to where they were looking down on the valley, they had their snacks or a mini picnic, they rehydrated and they were heading back down to the car park. Now on the descent down back to the car park, Jim claims that he was 20 feet away from Barbara where she was in front and just before they got over the ridge line, he wanted to look back and just see that beautiful scenic view one more time and he said he only looked at it for about 40 seconds. Now in that 40 seconds, he's turned back around to where he couldn't see Barbara. Now, when you're trailing behind someone, you generally try and speed up so you can just see them, just so you can stay in contact with each other. It's a bit of a security thing. Even if they are a stranger, you try and keep in a bit of a distance so there's more people on the trail, there's more traffic, there's more safety. But with this, he could not find Barbara and he was yelling out to her the entire time. Now, he started to jog, he started to run, and after about 10 minutes of running, he soon realized that he would have definitely caught up to Barbara, as she is a fit old bird, being 55, but he definitely would have covered that ground. Now, he went back to the lookout, he went back to the car park, and he did this about three times before he called the police. And that's exactly what he stuck with. Now, the police dug into this, and they sent out an entire search party. 
to which it only lasted for 48 hours as they couldn't even pick up a scent via the dogs. Not only that, they went to the exact lookout and they had heat thermal cameras that remained on standby in case they could see any movement, to which they got zero. Now, Barbara still remains missing to this day as Jim, well, Jim never changed his story and he was also happy to aid the police in the search and he was very happy to take multiple polygraph tests to which he passed them all. And well, with no trace, no sign of Barbara and the guy stuck into his story and passing all the polygraph tests thrown at him, well, they had to close the case on this one and Barbara's never been found to this day. Now, another thing that baffled Jim was it was eerily silent when she went missing. He said, it's a very loud terrain, like you're stepping on broken leaves and twigs, and you can hear people from a mile away. But he said the entire time he was running along the track, he couldn't hear a thing. There was no birds, no movement, and no noise. Now that is a common eerie occurrence in a lot of strange disappearances in the forest. If there's no signs of animals, then that usually means there is a predator lurking around. All right, let's get stuck into story number three. So generally when our ancient ancestors or our aboriginals or our indigenous people from the original land give places bad nicknames like the Badlands or the Dark Wilderness Canyon. It's usually because they were trying to give everyone a warning to stay out of these areas because they're extremely dangerous to the local fauna. There's also the risk of falling in these canyons and not being able to get out of them. So our ancient ancestors that didn't have climbing equipment gave these places these bad names so people would stay out of them. Now this is one of those stories where you just think, why would you go and do that alone? But backpacking is something I've never personally understood. Now this is a story of a young man named Paul who was 23 years of age. He was an experienced climber and a very experienced solo backpacker. Now what Paul loves to do was go and work at cafes and various jobs to get enough money to then go and escape society for a good five to ten days out in the wilderness. Now in this particular spot that he had chosen was in Utah called the Dark Canyon Wilderness. Now it gets that nickname from its tall rock faces and canyon walls that block any sunlight to come in, creating a very dark and mossy, moldy and foggy atmosphere all through the canyon and very poor visibility. But to Paul, this was the perfect spot where he had told his work that he's going for a two day hike where he'll be back after the weekend and ready for his next shift. Now, Paul got all ready, he got his gear, he's got all of his food packed and he's got enough water to last him for two days. But generally, Paul relied on his ability to find natural springs to refill his water bottles and if he could do that he would often stay longer as if there's a fresh water supply he had no dramas sticking around for a week or so. Now whilst he was in this canyon he felt a very eerie he recalled he felt very anxious and he felt like he was being watched the entire time. Now when he was on this walk he found this fresh deer head with his antlers sticking out. Now Paul knew that he could hike this thing out of here and he would take it to a taxidermy and get it mounted on a wall, which is a very typical American thing to do. And that's what he wanted to do. But on the track back with this deer head that literally weighed 15 kilos on the top of his pack, it weighed him down and he actually ran out of water. Now, when he did this, because of his experience, he knew not to push it. He knew to stay calm, park up for the night, go and find some fresh water or find some stagnant water and then boil it so it's drinkable. Now, so he set up his little tent and he set up a fire because he knew he was gonna go and find some water to boil. Now, when he found some stagnant water, he got a cup full of it, enough to rehydrate him for a little bit and he put it on the stovetop with his little canister of jet fuel and he started boiling the water. Now with this, he's like, okay, I'm gonna try and find where this water came from, to which a kilometer away, he found a natural spring. 
Now, when he went there, he stayed there for about half an hour and completely rehydrated and just sat down and cooled himself off. Now, this was the difficult part, as he had to make the conscious decision to go back to the campfire, which is a waste of energy, grab the water bottles, come back to the spring, fill them up, and then head back again. So that's exactly what he decided to do, as he needed water for the trek out of this canyon. So he went back to the spring with his bottles to where he's made it back there, and it started to get dark. Now, the canyon's already dark, and he can't see a thing. But now it's dark, and it's pitch black, and he can't see a thing. Now with this, he could see in the distance a glimmer of light from his boiling water that is around his tent, which is a kilometer away. So he just made his way through before the fog came down. Now he made it back to his tent to where he realized someone had collapsed his tent and taken the deer antlers and alongside with that, his backpack. Now being extremely anxious, dehydrated, with an extremely elevated heart rate, Paul had no idea what to do next. So he ran. Now Paul, by luck, ran so far that he actually started to see the night sky, which means he was on the elevation out of the canyon. Now, when he found the original track that he was on, he was running along where he stopped, looked down, and he realized he had been followed the entire time. Now, Paul did make it out of this canyon and was alive to tell the story, but it just goes to show you, you'd never know someone's true intentions as someone would have been actually hiding in that canyon waiting for people to come down. And that in itself is scary enough to deal with mountain lions and the, the trip hazards and falling down into a canyon and never being found. But now you've also got the threat of human beings lurking in these dark areas. Well guys, that's gonna be a wrap for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's campfire stories and join us tomorrow as we are going to be giving you three more. Alrighty then, take care.